Hello and welcome to the SciShow interview show, where today Skyping in to talk to us about the biggest problem humanity has ever created and maybe the biggest problem humanity has ever faced is the administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, Gina McCarthy, which is pretty cool. Hello, Gina. Hi, it's nice to be with you, Hank. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to dive right in and ask the hard question. Um, this is not just a giant difficult issue to handle. It is also a giant difficult issue to get people interested in helping with because it happens incrementally over a long time. There aren't a lot of big inflection points that are great news stories. Uh, and there are a lot of other things that people are worried about when we talk about climate change in terms in, in like ask people what they're concerned about. Uh, it ranks fairly low and yet it is the most important problem in the long term. How do we mobilize people to care about this? How do we mobilize governments to act on it? Well, Hank, you've, you've asked one of the pivotal questions that I've at least been asking myself for about 30 years now. Uh, but the, the sad thing is, and the good news is, that climate is already impacting us. So 20 years ago, we were worried about projecting things. Now we're worried about keeping up with the impacts that are already happening. And how do we adapt, uh, knowing that we have to take action now, and the failure to do that would be devastating for the planet over time. So I think, you know, in answer to your question, I think we need to be very clear that the climate is changing. We need to be very clear to get over the science questions because the science is overwhelming. Yes, this is a, I like to say man-made problem because I, I would prefer my side of the equation not to take credit for it. <laughs> You've been the economic drivers now, admit it. Um, and, in, in, you know, and I'd like to be able, once we put that aside, to have a really good conversation to make sure that people understand that this isn't about what's happening in the future, it is about today. And to make it very clear that if we don't take action now, the implications for the future are quite dire, not just for polar bears or what's happening in, at, in the ice melt. It's really about our kids. It's really about our kids' future. This is a personal issue. And people need to get personally engaged in it. Do you think since we're already feeling the effects and as projections look that we're going to be still, you know, working on decreasing our emissions while we're also adapting to these changes? Like in 2100, are we going to be bringing down our emissions and also building a wall around Manhattan? I think we're always going to be really trying to find a way to continue to innovate because the population is getting larger. People are having a broader impact on the environment, not just in climate. So we have to continue to, to innovate. I think the, the good news is, and because I don't want this to be uh, seeming like it's not a hopeful conversation, because frankly, I think the U.S. right now is better positioned than we've ever been to, uh, to take firm action. We're taking that. And that action is changing the international discussion as we're heading into Paris. So it is a hopeful discussion, but I think the, the lesson it, that I've learned is, is to try to communicate it as a real message for people. Let them know that the fires that you're experiencing, the droughts, the intensity of the storms are a problem. We have to adapt to that, but the real critical issue is, what do we do to not let it get worse? And that there are things that we can do that we're already doing. So it is a, a message of, sort of um, an extreme call to action, but I don't want anyone to think that we cannot resolve these and to continue to innovate over time. Because frankly, in my world, I've lived long enough, I'm 61, <laughs> I can remember when I was 11, and Lord knows the environmental problems there looked unbeatable. They were horrible. They are no longer there today. In some countries they still are and we're working on it, but man, if we get going, we can resolve these problems. So you mentioned Paris. Uh, yeah, you're, you're headed over there. What's, uh, what's going on there? What are the goals there? Well, we have a bunch of goals. But first of all, we started this a couple of years ago with, with the president's call to action, his climate action plan they, that he unveiled more than two years ago, and with our ability as agencies 
uh, at the federal level to really initiate the kind of actions that the president was calling for. So we have taken some great actions, most notably for EPA is our clean power plan that has sent a tremendous signal to the international world that we can get together and we can take action as developed countries. We've made some great inroads with China, with India. We've made inroads with Brazil. We have a lot of countries now weighing in, really countries that represent about 90% of the emissions across the world have already put commitments on the table in Paris. So we see the work that we've done as paving the way for a really good meeting in Paris. And so the question becomes, what constitutes a really good meeting? Well, so far, so good. We come in there, getting over the science question. These are countries that recognize across the world that we are facing a problem that deserves a worldwide response. So we really have three prongs to that, Hank. The first one is that we get some aggressive goals out there from all countries so that everybody participates. And as I said, we've, we've received commitments from about 146 uh, countries around the world. And, and that represents the vast majority of emissions uh, that we're, we've been emitting. And, and so that's a, a good step forward. The second would be to develop a framework to continue to make sure that countries are doing everything they can and they've committed to, to achieve those goals, but also to keep revisiting them. We are not going to be putting a series of goals on the table that's going to allow us to do and achieve what science tells us we need. But we get we hope to get out of the finish out of the starting gate soon and then to have a framework that everybody participates in that's transparent, that's good, strong accounting and that continues to challenge us to revise our expectations and revise our commitment level so that as innovation happens, new technologies come together, lessons learned, that we're not just standing still after we get out of the gate, but we're calculating the path to get to the finish line here. And then the third, the third leg of it really is a financial one. You know, we have to recognize that that while we have everybody needs to be at the table and every country really needs to participate, the the, the poorest nations are going to be disadvantaged in terms of making the capital investments they need to make to adapt to the, to the changing climate, but also to develop plans that allow them to leapfrog into a, a low carbon future, as opposed to inch away as the developed countries have so far. That's, that's very exciting in the way that, uh, the, that the developing world has leapfrogged, say, uh, telephone poles and telephone wires, which are extremely infrastructure intensive and cost lots of money. And instead, they were able to jump straight into cell phones, which have less infrastructure and can be much cheaper for, for the people. Um, is, are there, like, what's most exciting for you in terms of new technology that might allow that kind of, uh, you know, not just, uh, not just in the developing world, also for us, but allow us to get there faster? So if you look at how we designed our strategy, our clean power plan, to look at how to lower emissions by 32% below 2005 levels by 2030, we have found a way to do that that is going to maintain a reliable energy supply, that is going to make sure that we're not increasing the uh, cost of that energy supply in a way that's going to be detrimental, that continues to grow jobs. We've been able to do that because the energy world is already transforming and two things happened that are really attributing uh, that that's attributable to one actually maybe I'll go hit three the first is that that uh, in it, the advent of inexpensive natural gas has meant that 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 using coal as a fuel in the power sector is no longer affordable it is simply not competitive with wow. inexpensive natural gas so you are seeing significant shifts that we are watching and following in terms of how the real world is investing in energy today. The second thing is that the cost of renewables has gone down in a way that nobody projected, no one. So you now have solar that is competitive even against natural gas in some, in some areas. You have solar arrays that are a million panels that are large megawatt facilities that are integrating themselves into a market in the way that nobody ever expected or predicted before. So right now we have wind that's 20 times as much generation from, from I'm sorry, solar 
20 times as much generation uh, of electricity from solar today as when the, the president took office just a short time ago, at least in my window of short. Um, <laughs> and then we've got uh, wind that's that's already tripled. So this is changing the dynamic of how current investments are being made. And if we if we do this right, as we're doing with the clean power plan, we continue to move in that same direction while setting, putting a stake in the ground as far away as 2030. What that does is continuing to send a message on what we value and where we want investment to continue. So it's going to spark investment and innovation in the U.S. that has always driven us and given us the ability to make environmental improvements while we continue to grow the economy. Solar today is the, by far, the fastest growing job sector in the United States. Who'd have thunk that, Hank, a while ago? <laughs> So this is really cool to way to just to see how the world is shaping in the U.S. and how we use that experience when we're talking to China about how to, to help them achieve their low carbon future. And you talk to India about what their next steps might be. It's just it's a fabulous opportunity for us to show the way forward and to engage new innovations while we do that. You bring up natural gas. Uh, the burning of natural gas has far less impact than the burning of coal. But the you know the extraction, the creation of that cheap natural gas, um, you know, it's sort of a, a look at how the EPA's history has happened. Like it used to be about protecting like local areas and making sure that America's so like citizens and environment uh, were you know, and it still is of course about that uh, were protected. The but you know, to get that natural gas and like hydraulic fracturing is the way. How do you balance that? Where like making sure that you are protecting the land that that, uh, that extraction is happening on, and protecting the people around that land, and also focusing on this global problem that we have to face. Absolutely, and and you know, in some ways, EPA has a simpler job than than um, the energy secretary might. Because mm -hmm. I'm not making mm -hmm. the investments in how and how you move forward. I am recognizing that the world is moving forward. And my job is to grab that pollution and lower that. It's been the same job that we've had forever. So when we're dealing with carbon pollution, I'm using the same tools, the same strategy as I did with with NOx and SOx pollution and particulate matter, which, by the way, always go hand in hand in the power sector with high carbon. So you can again, get the carbon out while you're removing the other things. So I'm not making choices about whether states or anybody chooses natural gas or coal or chooses renewables. I am, my job is to make sure that the technology is there and the flexibility is available to states to lower their carbon pollution significantly while they make those choices. And you're absolutely right, Hank. We have a responsibility not to just provide incentives for low carbon future, but I have lots of other responsibilities to address pollutants that happen when you drill a well and you do hydro fracking, whether it's water protection uh, necessities or whether it's, it's also protections from volatile organic compounds which are emitted and methane. So, so it, it, you are absolutely right. Every fossil fuel supply is going to have challenges that, are, that have to be looked at in a broader way. And the president has been very clear that while we're not making choices, we're going after the pollution. So if, you're, if you're at, we're actually moving forward to regulate methane in the oil and gas sector, because we, rate, we understand that it's a really big deal. And if you want to have natural gas be part of the energy mix and this technology is available that can lower that pollution, then we should be grabbing those opportunities as soon as possible so that every mix can, everybody can have a mix, but that mix has to continually drive down carbon pollution in the direction that we know we need to head to protect our kids. As we uh, head into Paris for these climate talks, um, uh, are you optimistic? Um, more than ever. Um, I cannot say that I've always been optimistic heading into these, some of these meetings, um, but I think um, the scene setter couldn't be better. Um, I think we, we have done everything we could in the US and the president clearly has had tremendous visibility on this issue. 
really showing that we are providing domestic leadership, that we are taking strong action. We're going to defend that action moving forward and, and keep keep the push we need domestically. But we've also laid the foundation with some of the other larger economies um, across the world to really step up and, and have good commitments moving forward. So I think we have every reason to be optimistic, but we also have every reason to go to that meeting, pushing as hard as we can and recognizing that that push doesn't end at the end of any agreement being reached. It has to continue to ratchet down our carbon pollution so that we can get at the levels that science tells us is necessary to protect your kids, my grandchildren. Well, thank you very much. It, uh, uh, we've been joined by uh, Administrator McCarthy, the uh, head of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, what a wonderful treat to be able to talk to you and good luck in Paris. Thank you, Hank. Thank you so much. Thank you.